1996, eight miles off Long Island, a mysterious explosion destroys TWA Flight 800. Very much like JFK's assassination, it'll be a conspiracy. Ready? Well, the more energy you need, the less light. Next will be 50 millijoules. We're measuring the 100. And these objects converged. We reached our fuel tank. Our test today is to test the sensitivity of a, a jet fuel air mixture to detonation in a fuel tank. I'm a senior research engineer here at uh, EMRTC. My job is to construct experiments and do studies of explosives. The tank we have here is the center fuel tank from a 737 aircraft. And it's approximately one fourth the size of the one that was involved in the Flight 800 mishap. And what we're doing is we're placing a small amount of fuel in the bottom of the tank and then we're heating it to the temperature that is believed to have existed, which is about 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we'll be introducing a spark of various energies starting at a small fraction of a joule and working up until we get some kind of uh, ignition. We're expecting ignition if uh, the temperature and uh, other conditions are present. If you can demonstrate, for example, that a, uh, an empty or near empty center fuel tank in the presence of a static electrical charge, in fact, does cause explosions, I think that would be very convincing evidence. On the other hand, if you find out that it's almost impossible to do, then I think you have to look at another hypothesis. I think that if you cannot reproduce the cause of the crash, then I think everybody's mind should change. Well, I think it could be useful. I wouldn't argue against that. However, <clears throat> I'm a physicist and, and worked in the applied physics lab at Boeing for years. And the key to an experiment like that is, is its uh, veracity. You've got to design your experiment so it has the maximum amount of realism. The crew slowly heats the test tank so the fuel will vaporize just as it did on the hot tarmac back in 1996. This is the probe we're going to put inside of the fuel tank when we enter through a bulkhead and that's what this uh, sheet of plastic is here for is to provide a, a flange for mounting it on the bulkhead. And on this probe we have a, a small stirring fan to make sure that the fuel air mixture inside the tank is homogeneous, at least near the experiment site. We'll start first with small amounts of energy. It'll be a fairly weak spark. And as time goes on, and if we don't get any action, we will increase the strength of the spark until we do get a reaction. We also have a small camera that will be installed in here to watch this. One of the things we're trying to do is get the tank to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we'll have a temperature sensor lashed onto our probe here so it'll be nearby where the spark is occurring and we'll also have a temperature sensor on the floor of the tank inside to show what the floor temperature of the tank will be. Jerome and the EMRTC engineers have gone to great lengths to control the variables in the experiment and ensure the outcome is as accurate as possible. After 10 days of planning and construction, the parameters have been set and the sensors are in place. The moment of truth is approaching. We've been heating this now for about three hours, and we're finally approaching the temperature that we need for testing. With the conditions set to mimic that hot summer day in 1996, Jerome is ready to begin initiating the sparks. Okay, we're presently charging to start introducing the spark discharges. NTSB research suggests that a spark between 5 and 100 millijoules of energy would be enough to ignite the fumes in the tank. This is a four millijoules spark coming. And that apparently wasn't enough to not produce action. Next is uh, eight millijoules. Okay, ready, sparking. Good spark, it did not produce anything. Next is uh, 32 millijoules. Ready for spark. Sparking. No action. Next will be 50 millijoules. We're measuring the bolt.